Here I come. Hello. Hi, Mark. Hi, Jenny. I thought I was having some, I've been having some connection issues and I was, I was getting a little bit nervous that I wasn't able to connect, but I got it. Here you are. Here we are. Here we are. You're a little echoing. I don't know if that's just on my part or if anyone else can hear the echoing too. My, my echoing? Not anymore. Not anymore. Okay. All right. Hi, Desiree. Hi, Dr. Stevens. How are you? I'm doing okay. It's what day is it today? Thursday. All mm -hmm. right. Hi, Jenwan and Maria and Gary. We got our regulars, huh? Yeah, Hi. <laughs> this is the A, a team. The A team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you guys sometimes have other people connected to this, like community, other? community members or other community members as in our participants in 360 yeah 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 so um our, our normal is like norma she actually started working and so she won't be able to come okay today. um i believe dr loy might be in class i'm not 100 percent sure um and a lot of people do watch it online as well, like Desiree ah, said, connected okay. to the calendar. Okay, I got you. So I will say hello to all the online people. Um, Jan Wan, where is your, what's that backdrop? It's gorgeous. Oh, gee. I have to check with my husband. I, I can't remember um, where, where we were. Just a little bit of time time lapse, right? And Got he it. Edit, edits them, so the colors are just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, they're, thank they're you. They're really nice. Um, so shall we, Jenny? Just give me the thumbs up when when we want when you want to get started, and uh, I don't <laughs> need to. Okay, I don't need to share the screen yet, but I will in just a uh, in just a little bit so can everybody hear me and see me okay yes yes okay. yep and as previous um zoom teachings I, I i hope this will be uh more of a conversation than me just lecturing so if there's any times that you feel that oh, I don't understand what you're saying because sometimes I talk too much like a psychologist. Um, just, just interrupt me and, um, and then we will, we'll, we'll go from there. So the title of today's talk is Self-Talk, uh, Noticing and Effectively Using Your, your Thoughts. Um, and the goals for today is to really kind of reflect on what and what does not work for you in terms of using self-talk to improve your performance. And I'm gonna use performance as a wide band of just think about anything from fixing something around the house to athletic performance um, to, to academic performance. So self-talk has a a way of influencing uh, everything that we that we do. Um, <clears throat> I was just thinking, does anybody? And I didn't Google it because it just came to my um, my recognition or, or just my awareness. Does anybody remember the song "Talking to Myself"? And do you remember that song? Who yeah. sang that? Do you remember? Uh. <laughs> Talking to myself and feeling. Anyways, so there's been songs that have been written about self-talk. And the reality is, is I, I, I think it's absolutely impossible uh, not to self-talk. I, I don't know anybody that doesn't do self-talk. I think our brains are, are wired for self-talk. So it's happening all the time. 
And what's interesting is that sometimes self-talk that you think that you're just kind of listening to your own voice, it actually goes out there. And I don't know if you all have had the experience where you're kind of thinking something, doing some self-talk, and all of a sudden it spurts out. Like I'll be with my wife and she'll say something and I'll go, what? And she goes, oh, I'm just talking to myself. I go, oh, okay. So sometimes self-talk moves, moves out in, into the world, but most of the time, and, and for good reason, it, it, it stays with inside of you because I'm not sure that we want everybody to know what it is that we're what what it is that we're thinking or some of the self-talk that we have we don't we do know that there are some disorders particularly around like a Tourette's disorder or some other um, obsessive disorders that people cannot regulate uh, their outer talk that their self-talk becomes outer talk and it can become quite quite embarrassing um, for those folks. So today I want to talk, generally speaking, about self-talk. Um, I have an exercise that we're going to do that I want to make sure that we get through. And then, uh, time permitting, I'm just going to go over kind of the, the, the research around self-talk in terms of sports performance, because there's been a lot of research on self-talk and sports performance. So we'll have a little bit of time that I'll go over that with you. And I think you'll find uh, the findings pretty interesting and in how they sort of unpack self-talk in terms of, of sports performance. So we're going to start with self-talk. Um, and, and when I ask you to uh, participate in the, in the exercise, um, I'm going to ask you to do it within the realm of some kind of activity. It could be a sport activity um, that kind of meshes with our, our, our theme of being a, a three wins team. So let me share with you some of the things that we um, know about self-talk. Um, first of all, that we know that what people think influences their reactions and actions. It influences their, their reactions and actions. And I will say that what we also know is that sometimes self-talk is very linear in terms of it, it leads to this kind of reaction or this kind of action. But oftentimes self-talk is, is kind of unconscious that we're not thinking about it, and then it leads to unconscious actions and reactions. And sometimes then we're at a place going, I'm not sure why it is that I'm doing this. And that's the power of, of self-talk and getting to know, noticing your self-talk, because it brings the, the subconscious or the unconscious to the conscious. And, and we cannot change our our behaviors, our attitudes, without recognizing what our, our self-talk is and what our self-talk patterns are. There's a whole theory on this cognitive behavioral therapy that's very, very famous. We've got people like Albert Ellis and Mnuchin and some others. So I'm just giving you a really little taste of the psychology of, of self-talk but it's, it's basically a theory and some people work exclusively with people's self-talk in order to help them change their, their narratives and then subsequently changing their actions and reactions. Some of the terms that are used are like irrational or faulty self-talk and trying to sort of unpack the irrationality of one's self-talk and to move it into something that's more logical and ideally then it, it motivates the person to move in the direction that they want to move. So here's some of the principles, some of them I've said already. We create narratives consciously and unconsciously. And we often talk to ourselves. We'll find ourselves going, wow, or darn, or just a, 
you know, sometimes it's a little bit longer than that. And there's a little bit of a narrative, uh, a, a longer narrative with that. But oftentimes the self-talk is somewhat evaluative that it's, it's like, I liked it or I didn't like it. Um, so we ask ourselves questions with self-talk. And I think you guys will get a smile out of this, um, that you do things like before you leave the house, do I have everything that I need? That's self-talk. Um, where did I put my keys? That's self-talk. It's usually you're not saying it out loud. Where did I put my keys? Unless you're asking for help. But oftentimes you're thinking, where did I put my keys? And then you start to act on that. We give instructions during self-talk. Don't speed. Be careful of the corner. So we're not saying it out loud, but we're thinking it. And there's some kind of narrative that's around that. We criticize ourselves with self-talk. Boy, was that stupid. We also praise ourselves with self-talk. I did it. I like what I just did. So we often have a, a pretty interesting conversation that kind of goes unnoticed. So let's take the, the, the idea of don't speed. It's not like it's a loud, loud narrative and we're shouting it out, but it almost it, it, it starts to regulate us and it, and it starts to shape our behaviors, but it happens really, really quickly. And typically it happens, self-talk is, is, is about patterns. We have tons of different patterns that we've created. And, and so, for example, around don't speed, it might be around a pattern of, oh, I'm feeling rushed, I better not speed. Or I've gotten a ticket here, I better not speed. Or I know that there's police officers that have speed traps around here. I better not speed. So a variety of sort of patterns that we put together and then we end up making that kind of, of statement. And ideally, we listen to that statement when it's functional. Unfortunately, we listen to those statements when they're not functional. So one self-talk may be that's not functional is um, you know, I'm going to take the risk of speeding because I don't think there's any police officers around here. I know that I'm speeding, but I'm going to go ahead and take the risk. So the self-help talk is, or the self-talk is, I'm going to go ahead and speed. So the idea of changing our narratives about our self-talk to our benefit is really the key. And that is, a couple, one, two, three, four, five, six principles that I want to share with you. First, we need to first notice and catch our dysfunctional narratives to change our behaviors, to change our narratives and then change our behaviors. We need to listen to our negative narratives with compassion to change our narratives. The key word there is compassion, and I'm gonna, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. We need to practice listening to our negative narratives and to look forward rather than dread. We need to see changing our negative narratives as a part of self-growth. And we need to feel we deserve to change our negative narratives. And then the last part is we need to practice with perspective and with patience to create alternative narratives. Um, and if you'd like, Jenny, I can um, just share my, my notes with you. Um, I can share my notes with you if, if you would like, and then you can pass it on. Um, Sounds good. So any reactions so far, any questions? I'm just, when, when I do this, I'm always curious about where people go with this in terms of sometimes you, you start to almost giggle or laugh about, yeah, these are some of the self-talk that I do. And I, I haven't really, I haven't been aware that 
God, I'm, I'm in a self-talk mode a lot. Any reactions that you have? Desiree? Hi, yes, I, I, we actually had a fun uh, drill in my sports psychology class where we took paper clips and every time that we had a negative thought, we would move the paper clip from one pocket to the other. And yeah. we would mon monitor this over a, a few days. And I found that that drill helped me start to really recognize my negative self-talk within myself. Um, now I've gotten pretty decent at like kind of cutting negative self-talk out. I find that positive self-talk is still a bit of an enigma. Um, so yeah, maybe if we could delve into that a bit. Yeah, that, that would yeah. Well, that, it's a good point, Desiree, because the function of negative self-talk when, when it's at its purest sense is to, it's to protect us against danger. So our, our nervous system is, is wired for that to see the tiger running at us. And then our self-talk is, let me get the heck out of here. And that's really good self-talk. But when the tiger becomes a... A, a little bunny rabbit and you start to say, I better get the heck out of here. That's where your self-talk is a little bit more dysfunctional. In CBT therapy or behavioral therapy too, they actually use rubber bands and, and you ask your clients to put a rubber band and every time that you have a negative self-talk, you pop yourself just to, and it's kind of this, almost like a little bit of a reminder or a punishment of like, oop, I just, it brings it conscious that, oop, I just had a, a negative self-talk. So negative self-talk is not always terrible, but a lot of times it's not functional. The self-talk that we have to keep us from getting a speeding ticket or being in danger, that's good negative, that's, that's good self-talk to have. Other, other reactions, Anybody have any funny stories about self-talk that turned to external talk? Like you go, oh, I didn't mean to say that out loud. I, I actually think I've done that with my kids. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they're like, what? And I'm like, nothing. <laughs> no, but I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask about that, the self-talk. Um, I've noticed when I'm home alone, sometimes, I allow that self-talk to come out. But yeah. when people are around, I don't do that. So is yes. that normal? Yes, it's very normal. And in fact, when we get into a little bit more about sports psychology around self-talk, is there's two different text techniques. And one of them is the internal self-talk, but the other is external self-talk. And so when you give a, an athlete a, um, a suggestion about um, think this before the race, sometimes they think about it internally, but the research actually suggests that saying it out loud is a little bit more powerful. So for example, you might, one of the cues for a, a, a long jumper is stretch, stretch, stretch. So it could be a little bit embarrassing for the lung jumper to be get ready and they're ready to run, but they're thinking stretch, stretch, stretch as a way to tell their body. But some of them prefer to say it out loud, stretch, stretch, stretch. So that's an answer to your question. It's kind of a personal preference. Some people seem to like it, um, to say it out loud, it, 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 it kind of reinforces. It's a little bit like reading. Some pe people like to read out loud, that there's more comprehension when they read out loud. And some people just like to read without saying it out loud. So it's a kind of a similar kind of principle. Okay, I worried. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if that's normal, but I, yeah. as I'm getting older, I keep noticing, you know, different things. I'm a pretty absolutely. sure. Absolutely. I think it becomes problematic is when you really don't want to say it out loud because that's a little bit of a sign that you're overwhelmed with your self-talk and the, the, it's, the, the, 
the glass is running over. It's, it's, you're filled with too much anxiety. Um, so uh, I will tell you personally, uh, sometimes when I'm riding my mountain bike and it's just a little bit, it, I'm really stretched. Like I'm just pushing as, as, as hard as I can in terms of what I can do, making it up a very steep hill. And so I can feel the physical pain and there's a little bit of emotional pain. Now, sometimes I'm on that same hill and I'm not experiencing any emotional pain. I'm still experiencing physical pain. But when I'm feeling more emotional pain and I'm not sure it could have something to do with how my day was going, I, I will tell my friends because I, I said, you know, I've got this like Tourette's biking. It doesn't happen in other areas. And I'm going up and I, I will say, I'll swear, I'll go, you know, crap or the S word or even the F word sometimes. And I didn't even think that I was going to say it out loud, but it, it comes out. And I'm taking it as sort of funny because there's not a lot of consequences. But if I was doing that in another setting, uh, it probably would not be a wise thing to do. And and uh, but I haven't found myself doing it in a in another in another setting. But Are there um, certain personality types that um, uh, don't um, feel shy about laughing out loud to, to themselves or yelling at a during a sports uh, a, a yes. game? Yes. <laughs> Yes. And, uh, I mean, I never, I hardly ever uh, yell out, you know, or laugh, you know, I think I just internally. Yeah, I, that's a great point because it, there is a lot of culture and, and um, my wife is, is from the Asian culture. And, and if you've traveled around in, in Asia and, and maybe what you're talking about yourself, when... Um, when people in Asia laugh, they tend to cover their mouth. And it's almost like they're, it's a little bit of an embarrassment or, or something. So they, they cover and they're, they're laughing covered. You go to other places and the laughter is just, wow. <laughs> and they don't, you know, so there's, there's opposite of covering your mouth. And some people talk louder. Some people talk softer. So there is a cultural component to this based on a variety of uh, things like what's defined as rude and you know so in certain cultures if you go like this it's like you're being rude but in other cultures if you go way out there like that you're considered rude so it, it, there is some culture to it it's a great point that you made see Jalen and I grew up in the same household okay. but I'm opposite okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's look why at, I, I thought it was a, per, at, a personality type instead of a yeah, cultural. Yeah. And I can you know, be loud. I, I will say, Gary, that what I notice sometimes is that women in the Asian cultures that I've been to, they cover more than the men do. So maybe there's a gender thing here as, as <laughs> well. Be a good research study. Uh, a lot of my self-talk problems, I kind of wonder if it relates to memory, like you were talking about. Yeah. Where's my keys? And I, I'm always misplacing things. Yeah. <laughs> so then I'm self-talking. Well, where did I leave it? Yeah. All that kind of things. Well, and, and as we get older, because of some of the memory things, um, we have to train ourselves. So before I leave the house, I actually stop and think, do I have everything that I need because I don't like having to turn my car back and say, oh, dang, I forgot that present or I forgot. So you have to be really mindful and con conscious about that. Well, you know, S Steven's not here, right? Um, he has <laughs> a routine. I, I don't know exactly what it is, but you know, do I have my keys? Do I have my wallet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. one of them also is, is my zipper up? Yep. Because oh. he lectures. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And and that that 
I'll, I'll say that's true for me too, because my wife will say, <laughs> and um, what's the other, oh, the other big one, but it's really interesting. You all have the feeling when you don't have your cell phone, like you kind of feel naked a little bit. So cell phone is like, we're a little bit more habituated to remembering if we have our cell phone or not. But oftentimes I'll leave and I'll go straight to my pocket because I carry it in my right pocket and I feel it to see if it's, it's there. But I have had experiences. But the interesting part is I don't get too far away when I remember I don't have my cell phone. So we, we've become a little bit too addicted to our cell phone. So our memory is connected to a little bit of our, our addiction. Thanks. So um, can, Jenny, can you share this screen or do I, do I have uh, control to do it? I can give you permission. I can um, grant you access to share the screen. Give me a little, here, I will do that right now. Okay. Um, more. I'm going to make you a make you the host so that way you can share screen. Okay. okay. Okay, and I accepted your invitation and now I'm going to share my screen. Uh, all right. Okay. So this is going to be uh, where you guys get involved and um, I'm going to just give you a, a frame of how to do it, but this is your exercise, your, your, your mind exercise of the day. And, um, and there's no right way or wrong way how to do it. It's just whatever will benefit you the most. So let me give an example of negative self-talk. And with the same example, I'm going to give you an example of positive self-talk. And the idea is, again, let's notice what our negative self-talk is because we can't change our negative self-talk until we really notice it and nuance it. And um, the only shame of negative self-talk is not the negative self-talk itself, is if we don't notice it and we let it run us or rule us in ways that aren't to our benefit. So let me give you an example. My goal is I want to exercise more. And here comes the big one. And I want to exercise more, but anytime you put a but after a goal, you're going into negative self-talk. So be careful of your butts. Don't let your butts get in your way. So here's this but. I want to exercise more, but I'm just too lazy. I don't care about myself enough. I can't follow a plan. I can't handle the pain. I don't have the time. So they're both sort of a combination of excuses, past experiences of a, you know, a rigid mindset, a fixed mindset of what, what uh, what cognitive therapists call a fixed mindset. So we're trying to move from a fixed mindset to a more flexible mindset. So I'm just too lazy is probably a negative narrative that you've had. And then you've all heard of self-fulfilling prophecies. It starts to, you start to identify I'm lazy. I will tell you on a side note, lazy is probably one of the most destructive self-talks that you can offer yourself. The other one is I'm stupid. Those are just awful, terrible self-talks and they don't really get to what the issue is. And most people end up taking the easy way out and as soon as you say I'm too lazy, they stop. That's kind of this, uh, this wall. So we have to get away from this wall and move to it being a speed bump rather than this brick wall. So how do we get to a speed bump from a brick wall? 
So an example of positive self-talk around, I want to exercise more. And so you noticed all the negative self-talk. I've done that. I've noticed it. Now what do I want my different narrative to be? So I say, I want to exercise more and I change the but to an and. It changes the whole feeling that you have on the inside. Anytime you're making an excuse, take the but and move it to an and. Or take the but and say, up until now. I am just too lazy up until now, etc. So, and here's some of the ideas of what you can do around your positive self-talk. I'm not chained to my past behaviors and attitudes. That is a fact. That is an absolute, absolute fact. And unless you have severe, severe brain damage, nobody can convince me otherwise that you are not chained to your past behaviors and attitudes. And I can prove it to you. You give me a behavior attitude that you are, you feel like there's no way I'm changing that. I can, I will say to you, I will give you $2 million to change that behavior and attitude. I guarantee you that all of you would change that behavior and attitude. So then it becomes an issue of incentive rather than I can't. I've had somebody say, I, I just, I, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I challenge them. If I were to give you $2 million, would you find a way to do it? Absolutely. <laughs> so it's in you. It's not like, you know, it's in you. You can do it. And I'm not giving you the $2 million before so you can pay a whole bunch of coaches and do a whole bunch of, no, right now, do it, and then I will reward you with $2 million. Coming back to I want to exercise more, I am grateful for this desire. That's positive self-talk. You give yourself credit for wanting and for this desire. The other next thing is I don't have to do this alone. That's positive. I don't have to do this alone. Oftentimes, if there's shame connected to a, a want or a goal, you, you, feel, you think, oh, I've got to do this all by myself. I don't want to let others know that I struggle with this, or I don't get help, or I don't create an accountability partner. The other part that really messes up people is they feel like they have to be perfect at what they do. So I don't have to be perfect. I can set goals that I want to exercise on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday. I skipped on Thursday. Okay, you don't have to be perfect. I will pay attention to my pushes and my pulls, meaning what's bringing me closer to doing this and what's moving me away. I will pay attention to my resistance without beating myself up. Compassion goes a lot longer than a punch. A punch gives immediate sort of um, change of behavior. A threat of a punch changes a behavior, but it doesn't internalize in ways that you can keep it going. So it is really the compassion that you have for yourself around the resistance that allows you to carry it through in a more longitudinal way. And then the last part is, I will be patient with my results. Oftentimes, our self-talk is, I'm not getting there the way that I wanted to. I thought by now I would be running the the mile in this, or I thought I'd be able to lift this much weight, or I'd be able to, 
you know, keep from eating ice cream or whatever it is. It's so important to be patient because if you're not patient, you get critical. And when you get critical, you give up. And that's not what we want here. We don't want the giving up. So you want to look at what you're feeding your brain, your mind that moves you towards giving up. Any questions, comments? What about, would you guys be interested in doing an exercise? I'll tell you what the exercise is, or, or you guys can do this exercise outside and then I can get to the, the, the using self-talk as a tool to enhance um, athletic performance. What, what would you guys prefer to do? And I know there's probably other people that are on the line too, but would you prefer, I just tell you what, what the exercise is and you do it on your own or do it right now? Tell us what it is and then we'll decide. <laughs> okay. So the exercise is actually to take a goal of yours and to pay attention to all of your negative self-talk around it. And then the goal would be to then create a a PST, a positive self-talk that would push against the negative self-talk. So it's, it's, it's bringing to consciousness the negative self-talk and then it's exercising your brain in terms of what you would like the positive self-talk to be that you think could really be beneficial to you. Well, maybe I can also, <laughs> I, I can also, because you might feel a little rushed with time, I can also write out what I just said and then send it to Jenny and then you guys could, could, could have it and do it on your own. Well, if somebody wants to volunteer um, a negative thought, maybe we could um, all uh, as a group uh, try to think of the positive because I like to try out that and and um, how what a difference it makes okay. to to change from a but to an and. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, we well, yeah. So let's all stay together and let's 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 give an example, um, and then let's let's play with it a little bit, and then we can move into the. The, the sport part of it. Anybody have an example? Desiree? Okay. Here's a good one. So um, a lot of times when I'm uh, feeling like not unmotivated to move because overall I just love moving. Uh, but sometimes I'll think to myself, ah, it doesn't matter what I look like aesthetically because it's like when I get to my weight anyways, I'm just going to be all hanging skin. Like mainly just because like I was over 350 pounds. So like I just, it's a reality that like I've accepted, but I can be kind of negative about it to myself. Like, and it's almost like I don't even know how to appreciate aesthetics at all. So I'll just say something like, oh, I don't care what I look like. Cause I'm just going to look like crap anyways. <laughs> so I, I would say, I would say, and there are ways where nobody would ever notice that skin or whatever you're talking about only you when you take your clothes off but i think i think uh it may not be apparent to anybody else yeah that's kind of the moving into more of a kind of a a, a larger perspective um that would be one the other i might say to you desiree is you know, you have a right to feel that way. Like that's okay to, to, it's okay to want to improve yourself. So I think both are, it, it just depends on what the, the saliency of the positive self-talk and what will motivate 
you. Yeah, that makes sense. Luckily, I love moving, so I'm always motivated for moving. <laughs> but sometimes I do. I yeah. Sometimes I let that kind of negative talk in because. I just don't understand certain aesthetic goals, you know, because a lot of people are like, oh, I want abs. And then I'll just think to myself, well, I mean, A, that's going to take a lot of lifestyle change. And then, you know, it's also like, I just think to myself, like, then, I, then I'll think and reflect on myself and I'll, I'll let that negative in sometimes because it's like a goal I would never really create just because of that too. So it does feel a bit limiting. Um, yeah. And yeah, so sorry, sorry, it's a little maybe TMI. <laughs> it's, no, it's, 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 a great, it's a it's a great example, and I'll, I'll say one other thing is that your wish or desire to do that, for me, the 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 biggest motivator would be, I want to look good to myself, because if you're focusing in on, and that sort of goes with what Juan is saying, if if you want to do this for somebody else, it's not going to be as powerful. So for you to say, I want to do this for myself because I can't control how other people are going to react to me. So I want to do this for myself becomes the, the positive self-talk. All right, cool. Thank you. I would like to add to that, Desiree, just because I, you know, after having three, three babies, you know, the stomach's not the same. Um, when I exercise, I kind of like I, I usually exercise in front of a mirror to check my form, but then I kind of look at that. That's the first thing I look at is my little pouch, how it's still stretchy. And even though I've lost weight too, it's um, that that negative self talk does come to me. But I always say, but look at how far I've become. I mean, I've come along. <laughs> so I think you should maybe embrace that your change. So it's kind of a you're 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 saying, gosh, I'm glad I'm having this as a problem right now. This is a good problem. This is what I wanted. Exactly. This is a really good problem to have. Exactly. Oh yeah, it's a heck of a lot better than still being over 350 pounds. So <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Jan Juan, did you have something else? Did you have something in mind that you wanted to, to ask about, to put out there and see how to kind of move, you know, the, the negative self-talk to a positive self-talk? Um, no, I, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> but I, it's something good to think about. Okay. So did that make sense to you? Did it kind of help to clarify the, what I've been talking about with a real life situation with, with Desiree, did that help to kind of clarify how you can kind of pay attention to a negative self-talk and move it into a positive self-talk? And I think it's good that you pointed out that um, you're really doing it for your, yourself. Yes. And that being the motivator. And typically, when you do things for yourself, again, it's, it's, it's sort of like self-compassion. It tends to have uh, longer legs to it. It, it. it tends to last uh, longer and sustain. Um, you can get motivated by negative talk, um, but it, it doesn't really get to the heart of the matter. You know, Desiree can say, um, boy, I just don't want people making fun of me. And th that can have some power to change her behavior. But ultimately, in order to really sustain, it's about doing it for herself. Any other questions about this before we move to sport in specifics? All right, you guys ready to, it's kind of similar, but it, it's a little bit more nuanced and I think you'll enjoy, uh, again, some of the, the ways of, of thinking about how sport is, is, um, is used. So, you know, I'm just gonna show you my, my notes 
Um, and uh, this is what these are my my talking points. So, um, sports psychologist, one of their big big tools is around self talk, and there's a lot of research around how to use self talk effectively with athletes, and uh, and some of the. Um, some of the, the, the issues that, that might be presenting. Early back in my career, I'm going to bust myself in terms of making a pretty big mistake. And I just didn't know enough about the science of performance and the science of sport. So I was working with a swim team at a, at a, at a, a, a university in San Diego. Uh, and so the coach gets me in and, and I um, was there, be, I, I was there before, I think the day before their meet, they had a really big meet coming up. Uh, it could have been, this is back in 1982. So this goes way back. It could have been right before the event. Uh, I think that's more accurate. So they're all in the, in the uh, room. I knew them a little bit, but not individually. And I had them go through a closed eye process that got them kind of really charged up. And they felt really, really charged up. It was kind of a motivational picturing themselves, blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> funny, the, the coach tells me the next day, he goes, he goes, Mark, your, um, your intervention with them worked really well, but it didn't work very well. I go, what do you mean? They go, my athletes had some of the best first splits that they've ever had. And they had some of the worst final splits that they ever had because they were not ready to go out as fast as they did in the, in the sporting event. So it was a learning experience for me that when you're doing this, you have to be you, you, you have to calibrate what it is that you're doing and how it's going to kind of impact them. And in so many ways with sports psychology, you can get people really activated, but maybe you don't want to get them too activated. Maybe you want to be able to, to have them see the, the event more in a longitudinal way. So to create different images that will help them go through their event, if it's a long event, in a smoother way. You don't want a marathon runner getting all charged up and having the best two miles that they ever had, but not being ready to finish the race. So that's one of my funny, funny stories. I've made other mistakes as well. But there's two different kinds of self-talk. There's instructional self-talk, and then there's confidence building self-talk. We're a little bit more familiar with the, the confidence self-talk, which is trying to help them create a, a narrative that you can do it, you got it, I feel good, I'm prepared. Sometimes we ask our athletes to say it internally. Sometimes we ask the athletes to say it um, out loud. Um, and then there's the other self-talk, which is more instructional. So before an athlete might get to their, um, their, their sport, their, um, the event, the task that they need to do, they end up creating some words um, or some images. And so it might be breathe, follow through, wrist, flow, dolphin, long legs, enjoy the moment. So let me take the wrist one. Anybody have an idea what sport wrist is used a lot in and, and, and what, um, where it, what it's for? Water polo and tennis, volleyball too. It, it could be all of that. It could be all of that. The most common one, anybody else have a guess? A guess? Baseball, something That's throwing. No, basketball and free throws. Free throws are all about the follow through. It's all about what your wrist 
does. Because if you have a wrist that goes up like this, you're shooting like a shot put. So the instruction is to stay really loose and follow through. Go and watch basketball players now. Many of them, they just get trained. They say, don't worry about your shot, worry about the follow through. And so you remind whatever sport it is, what aspect of what they're doing you want them to remind themselves of. With golfers on putts, back of the hole, back of the hole, back of the hole, or relax your shoulders, relax your knees, whatever that may be. And you end up ideally working with the athlete that it gets co-created because you don't want to just go in and I'll talk about that in a little bit. You don't want to just go in and say, say this, but you want to co-create that it's something that's meaningful for them. So facilitating self-talk in sports, it facilitates learning and enhancing performance. It helps to enhance attentional focus. It increases confidence. It, um, it's regulating of, of effort. Um, and I guess I'll admit this person since I am now on, okay, you're admitted. And uh, it controls cognitive and emotional reactions and triggering automatic uh, execution. So that's kind of the science of some of what that does. My example with the swimmers, I did not help them regulate their effort. In fact, I did the opposite of that. So the research suggests that in the context of sport, it's the type of task will be influenced differently by the type of self-talk. And so with fine motor skills like dexterity, hand-eye coordination, precision, those are things like putting, free throws, throwing darts. There's some different kind of self-talk that you, you might want. In the more gross motor uh, skills, the endurance, strength, and power like cycling, shot put, long distance runner, Desiree, power lifting. Those are all different kinds of sports that take a little bit different kind of self-talk, whether it's instructional or confidence, or it's a reminder of the instruction. The key for me when I work with athletes is try to figure out what best works with them. Because some people are a little bit more visual, some people are more auditory, some people are more kinesthetic, some people want the image Image and some people want to feel it. So you end up just working with the athlete to see what is the best cue that you can work together that would enhance their performance. The other thing that we know, and I'm rushing through this, I'm sorry, is that when you're doing sports enhancement, it's going to be different for beginners, more experienced, and then elite. You know, oftentimes with beginners, if they have a lot of nev negative self-talk about, I can't do this, you try to help them. And so it's a little bit more confidence. As they gain a little bit of confidence, you then start to move into the instructional part as they get to know the sport a little bit more and you work with them around the instructional part. You know, if you take a new skier or a, a new bicyclist, you know, with a new bicyclist going downhill, for example, is look where you want to go, not where you want to fall. So that's that you just train them. Look where I want to go. Look where I want to go. Another message is trust your bike, trust your bike. So you help create some messages that will help them get more into what's called the flow. Um, uh, I have found, and I said this to you, that self-selected self-talk is most effective. So when you collaborate with the athlete to come up with the best self-talk, um, it's great. You know, I remember working with a, a skater and she was trying to, I don't remember if it was going from a double to a triple or a double to a two and a half, and we sort of had to come up with an image that she wanted to have as she was just sort of spinning up, up in the air. And so she created this image of a, of a, a fast moving 
wind chime and that she had the wind beneath her feet and allowed her to just catch, catch the wind, catch the wind. And that became her, um, her, her talk, not during the performance, but before, because the performance is happening so quick, but before the performances, catch the wind, catch the wind, catch the wind. And then, you know, it's just an experiment. Um, whether it's for some people internally saying it before your event or what it is that you're going to do. Sometimes people like the, the internal and some people like to say it external. And if you watch athletes on TV, you'll notice they're doing something. They've created some kind of ritual. Um, I'm a big fan of basketball, so I happen to know many of the rituals. Some of them will bounce the ball a number of times before they go in a free throw. They're just trying to get to a rhythm. Some of them will uh, take a deep breath. Some of them will look at the basket a certain way. Some of them will look at the ball a certain way. Look at runners when before they start the event, they oftentimes have some kind of rituals or either closing their eyes. Some of them are doing some kind of, of self-talk. So that's, a, that's an awful lot in 15 minutes, uh, but I hope that it's giving you just a little bit of a, a, a wider frame to be thinking about how self-talk can be effective in your life. And for those of you that are, have really embraced sports to a certain degree, and it's, just, and it's gonna be more than just fun, um, you might want to think about how to best utilize self-talk to enhance your performance. I'm going to, to stop talking there and just, we've got a, a couple minutes and to see if there's any questions that you have, because if you have a question, there's a good idea that someone in the audience that is not here has a similar question as well. Um, so this imagery, vis visual imagery is a form of self-talk? The visual imagery can be a form of, of self-talk. It's, it, it's how I use self-imagery, sometimes it's all imagery and it's, it's creating muscle memory. You know, you want your athlete to say, how do you want your muscles to feel? How do you want your heart to feel? But you're also in the visualization before you start, you know, how do you want your mindset to be? Now, sometimes when I work with an athlete, I get to know them. Then I create a specialized guided imagery for them that includes the kind of self-talk that we've already developed that is uh, beneficial to them. Okay, thank you. Good question. Yeah. Another question or comment? I wanted to ask about, um, we were talking a lot about athletes and how they use self-talk. Um, is this the same thing for, let's say me, I know we talked about motivation um, at a different meeting, but or for a participant, how can we teach them about uh, self-talk for them to go ahead. Like you said, you know, sometimes you might not do your exercise the one day yeah. um, and we're not there with them or every single day. So how can we encourage them to put that into practice? Would it work the same way as for athletes? Oh, absolutely. Without a doubt. And athletes, they disappoint themselves all the time um, and they have to figure out what to do once they get disappointed. I think I had shared with you, I was working with a golfer once when, when he would miss a putt, his self-talk between, between the 17th and 18th hole was so destructive that I had to work with him to really change his, his self-talk because he could not get to the 18th hole and be present because he was so stuck on the 17th hole. So I had to work with him. We created a little ritual that's that just 
throughout the 17th hole so that he says, I'm, I'm with the 18th hole. We created a little kind of fun little ritual of a piece of paper, put on the 17th hole, wrapped it up and just threw it away. So there's other ways that you can work with an athlete to sort of get rid of that. The first part though, Maria, is to ask them to remember what happens when you don't do it the way that you want to do it, because that, that's the first step. And then, then you can create a, a cue for them. Okay, when you didn't, you skipped exercising for, for two, three days, or you ate something you didn't want to, or whatever that may be, what do you want to say to yourself very quickly what image do you want to have very quickly? What funny statement do you want to have very quickly that can move your mindset? So that's where you can work with this person to, it's almost like the power of metaphor. Metaphor is incredibly powerful. So if you can help them create a metaphor, an image that will help them move into where they want to be, that can be very important. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have a have a question? All right, folks, I'm going to clean up what I have done with my notes. Um, I'll add the exercise onto it. And would anybody else like for me to add anything else onto this that would be helpful for you? The wonderful thing about Google and our internet is if you Google self-talk, um, this th what you've seen from me is, is just coming from my head. It's not, it's just over my, my experience. But you can find a lot on self-talk, self-talk exercises to change. So, you know, if you feel like you, you want to dig a little bit deeper into it, um, go ahead and Google it and you'll find a lot of tons of resources on it. You can buy books and exercises and, and things like that. All right, folks, be well. And uh, let's see, I'm going to, what am I going to do? I'm going to stop sharing so I can say goodbye to you all. Um, uh, why am I not able to stop sharing? Oh, I see. Come on. Huh. I'm not able, let's see. Now that might be it. Mark, on the bottom of your screen, it should say um, stop sharing screen. I know, and, and oh, maybe I'm just not open wide enough. Um, I'm trying to figure out where that is. Come on, folks. What's so interesting, oh, maybe I, I shortened this. I, I can't see it. Anyways, okay. Um, yeah, I know usually where it is and I cannot. Oh, you know why? It's got a different prompt and it's up in the left-hand corner. Huh. Oh, I see, okay. I was going to the bottom. I go, where is that? Where is that thing? All right. Hi, Pam, thanks for joining us. All right. Okay, folks, be well. Stay, stay healthy, stay motivated, and uh, keep on doing the, the good work that you're doing for yourself and for others. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. All right. Take care now.